Welcome to the uh, Indigenous Science and Pacific Ocean panel today. I'm Alexis Bunton. As I said, I co-direct the Bioneers Indigeneity Program. And I'm here today with three incredible people that um, I'm just so excited. I can't wait to hear what you're going to say. Um, and I'll introduce all of you in just a moment here. Um, but this panel is uh, really exciting for me. A few years ago, we held a climate change and Pacific Ocean panel, and all men were on the panel. So we're switching it up a little bit this time. And, um, and so the ocean is something, especially the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I grew up uh, between uh, Washington State, Alaska, and Hawaii. So I've always been around the Pacific Ocean. And, um, and my ancestors certainly have been seafaring people for thousands of years, um, some of whom made the best boats in the whole wide world ever, according to me. <laughs> but um, even on my non-native side, all Northern Islanders, on my native side, it's all about the ocean for me. Um, when I grew up and made, made it in life, um, I now I'm proud to say I can live within a mile of the Pacific Ocean, which is pretty amazing. And um, I just love to visit it every day and learn what I can and do ocean science translation and uh, learn about our traditional knowledge related to the ocean. Um, so um, another thing that's really, I, I'm really passionate about the care and restoration for the Pacific Ocean. And I think a lot of people don't understand how very much we are connected to the ocean, even if we don't get aren't lucky enough to go to it all the time, several times a week, like some of us here. And um, even people who are way out in the middle of the country, like say Nebraska or something, all those crazy weather patterns we've been seeing, that's because there's stuff going on with the ocean, with oceanic warming, the shifting of the currents that are affecting everybody everywhere. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear from our panelists today. And so let me get into some brief intros. If you want to know more, you can, of course, visit their bios. But to the left of me here is Andrea Kealoha. And uh, she is at the, she's going to be at the University of Hawaii Manoa um, Oceanography Department. Currently, she's in Maori, Maui, Maui. I can't say it right. You, you Maui. Can, Maui, OK. Uh, and she's an oceanographer that specializes in climate change and human impacts to coral reef health. And then Loa, I did not practice this. Let me, let me do it right. I'm gonna do it right. I'm gonna do it right. It. New Meitolu. Got it. Great job. <laughs> uh, Loa is a poet, a community organizer, educator, farming teacher, trained in planting taro and other foods. Um, and she worked as a land steward at both Segorite Land Trust and at Gill Tract Farm. Uh, Loas are local. And um, this panel is really all about the connections between land and ocean. So we thought it was really important to have farming, um, that perspective that you bring. And then Kiana Frank. And Kiana is an assistant professor in the Pacific Biosciences Research Center at University of Hawaii Manoa. So these two are going to be colleagues really soon. Um, she, you didn't know I was going to say this, but she's also a badass media maker. <laughs> and so you can check out her webisodes. I have. And she studies how microorganisms shape the land for productivity and health. And so I'm going to start out with an open question to everyone, um, just kind of in this order. And the opening question is, can you tell me how and where you got your start with understanding the relationships with land and ocean and um, your family and your upbringing. How does it all fit together? Um, OK, so as Alexa said, I'm from Maui in a small town called Paia, which is a beach town. And I, I come from a, a large Hawaiian family with very strong connections to the ocean. So, you know, all of our family parties are at the beach. We scatter the ashes of our loved ones in the coastal waters of Paia, so they're always there to protect us. And that whole area of Paia has been our family fishing grounds for six or seven generations now. Um, so when I was a, a little girl, my dad and my uncles would go and pick opihi on the rocks, limpets. Mm -hmm. And they would gather opihi for family luau's. 
And I would beg and cry for them to let me tag along with them. Traditionally, fishing was the men's job. And so it really kind of took a while to get them to let me tag along with them. And eventually, I started spearfishing with them. And for the first year or two, really all they allowed me to do was hold the line of dead fish and swim around with it. So it was basically like the shark bait. <laughs> I, yeah, all I could do was watch. And um, then I graduated to making my own spear gun, which I made out of wood, steel, string, and old bicycle tires. And it's the same gun that's been used by my family for generations, and it's the same gun that I still have today. And so when, before we would jump in the water to go diving, we would go and check the water. And we would sit there for what seemed like forever to me. I was so impatient. Why can't we just get in the water? Um, but now that I look back, what I realize is that my dad was teaching me how to kilo and to observe and to build a relationship with my environment. My dad had been observing the ocean for so long that he could look at the ocean and he knew exactly what the tides were doing, the waves, the currents, and he could take all of these observations and forecast conditions. And he knew exactly where the fish would be hiding so that when we came out of the water, we had a long line of fish. Um, I didn't have the long line of fish. I had just a couple of fish, but everybody else has a long line of fish. And um, in these kilo sessions, he would talk to me about how abundant our ocean was when he was younger, how big the fish were, um, how there were all of these other species of fish that we just don't see now. Um, and that made me really sad. It made me feel a little bit helpless because I didn't have the resources or the knowledge to do anything about it. And so I think that that's what, that's what helped me to build Kuleana responsibility for protecting the ocean um, for you know, my family and my culture, and that's what led me into oceanography. And so I've, you know, been through many years of academia by now, and I've met a lot of very smart oceanographers, but um, my dad is still the smartest oceanographer I know <laughs> because he has all of that traditional knowledge and all of this genealogical knowledge that you just don't get in the classrooms. And I am telling you this because I think that our society really acknowledges kind of the degrees and, and the knowledge that's gained in our classrooms, but um, there's this whole wealth of knowledge that's held by our kupuna and our community members that I think we need to incorporate that you know, knowledge into mm. our, oh. our ocean ecosystem oh. solutions. Mm -hmm. Malo, Andrea. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, Kainga. Fagamalo, Fagafitai. Go call a gay who fung a Fagatapu. Kilki cow hit out. Don't know going. Now, when we're talking about the land and we're talking about the ocean, there's a whole, whole prodigal to that where I come from. And that's what we come from. We come from Moana Nui Akiva. So it's. um. It's no small feat for us to talk. I mean, you're going to ask me that question. It's a, it, ask us that question. It's a question that we do not hold on our own, that we never can. It's not ours to hold. But it, we are the vehicles, you know, and you, you hear what we, we do different, um, the different things that we do with that. And so um, the first thing I, I have to say is that, um, well, first of all, we, we, um, we are here, too, with Karina Gould, who's in the front row the uh, tribal chair leader of the Lishan Ohlone, the indigenous people of this land. So being from Wana Nui Akiva, we honor you, Karina. We thank you for, thank you for coming to our humble um, panel. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much to relatives. Thank you for all of your, um, all your kainga that are here with us, all your ancestors that are here with us too. But uh, so I said, we're from Wana Nui Akiva. So we, we um, that's um, the Kanaka Maoli sisters, they're from Hawaii. And then I'm from Tonga. But we cannot say that we're from Wana Nui Akiva just like that, like just because we have Tongans and Hawaiians up here. Um, I have to totally also honor 
that we have, um, we, we have to honor our Micronesian um, relatives too. So it's like the people, Chukis from Yap, Marshallese, and of course, you know, um, Tautala Tasi, the Chamoru. That's um, people of the sea in Chamoru. So, so they are here with us too. We're not alone here um, as we sit here. And then, of course, I also have to thank and I have to honor also our Melanesian relatives from places like the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, and West Papua, and many, many thousands of islands in the sea. So it's now we are together. So that's who is, is here, really, that you see. I hope you can see, see us and you can feel us in this, in this short time, that you have that moment to feel who we are as um, Wana Nui Akiwa. Um, for the Melanesians, they say one salt water. That's in pidgin because they have many languages, and that's one salt water. And then, as I said, um, Tal Tal Tasi and Chamoru, the people of the sea. And it's also, um, I bring my own um, Tongan and my um, relatives from the Pacific who are close to me, um, the Uvean, my Uvean relatives too here. And um, we say we're Kai Tahi. The people, Kai eat Tahi ocean, the people who eat the ocean. And so with this deepest humility, that's, that's what I bring here. And so how do, I, how do I know who these people are? Like, I just, I think I, I just um, told you some people who live like thousands and thousands of miles away from each other. So how do I know who these people are? And like with the memory, like with colonization, how do I have that, how do I have that memory to know that? Well, I have to thank my, I have to of course thank my um, grandparents and then of course my teachers. But I, what I want to tell you about how I know this is because we are a voyaging people. The Pacific, I, um, you know, you'll hear me uh, call our names interchangeably. The people from Pacifica, we're a voyaging people. And to be a voyaging people, we are in one third of the land, um, uh, one third of the earth. Um, how do you say it, everyone? <laughs> uh, the earth mass, you know, that's one third. Uh, um, that's uh, the, the great Pacific Ocean takes over. And so, Moana Nui, so now I'm going to speak with what I learned as, as a Tongan kid. So Moana Nui is my great, is my grandmother. She is the Pacific Ocean. And so when we, when we look at water, or when you hear me talk about water, um, also because I, I don't, well, you know, I could talk about irrigation and these kinds of things and rivers and stuff, but I'm going to always talk about water too as our grandmother Pacific Ocean on this panel. And so that's how, um, that, that's how Pacific people look at ocean and land. So as voyagers, to be a voyager, you know, um, people think, okay, voyaging, right? So you think about the big European ships, and then maybe you saw the Hokulea, our beloved um, Hawaiian Hokulea, right? There's this idea, the Hokulea is a beautiful um, um, wa'a, right? Kiana is what you say in Hawaiian. But there's this idea, of course, of just always production, you know, maybe the, the, these ships racing or something, you know, they're big and they're just like, how powerful are they? But for, to be a voyaging people, you have to be a, a people who live the ocean life. You live the, the life of the sea. And of course, with colonization, that was taken away from us. But that's one thing that I, I want to, um, with colonization, that was taken from us. And you know, um, even, even, to, 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 even to today, even with the Hokulea out there, there are still many people who, who like to contest that Pacific Islanders never were voyagers, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that we were drifters out there in the great ocean, you know? Even with all the explorers, including um, Captain Cook, who came to Tonga and to Hawaii, the Hawaiians killed him, for, for him, um, you know, breaking a lot of protocol that was, that, was, that was very tapu, like killing people and raping people, you know? The same things that we heard in our last Land Back panel. But, um, I'm talking about what it takes to be a voyaging people. So a voyaging people are, are we are people who
who understand, who have, worked, who have lived in, um, in millennia with the land and with the sea. And when you're talking about a voyaging people, we know the ocean very, very well. In this conference, I, I hope that, you know, when you take time to hear, because we're in the indigenous forum, so we could talk about indigenous things in, in a real way. When you hear um, people talk about, um, about the land and the ocean, like whales, and remember that there has been people, you know, from millennia who have lived with the whales too, who know the language of the whale intimately, intimately, and do not have access to publishing and access to, to um, sonar and cameras and things. But I just want you to think of that when you, when you come to Bioneers. So you think about when you hear these conversations happening in this conference, that you remember that, that indigenous people have lived in the Caribbean. And they know the water patterns. And they know and they love their whales. And they love, and whenever anyone talks in this conference, when people talk about a tree or an animal, ask them, what about the, le the people around there? Do you want to know the, le the animal or a plant? Also get to know what is going on with the people around there. It's, it's, a, it's a whole thing. It's not, you don't take the, the animal out. Or, or the insect out, this is, it's, it's, you know, it's an ecosystem. That's, that's what's going on there. I'll, I'll end with um, Epeli Haofa, he's a Pacific scholar. And just, um, just to reiterate my point about uh, our grandmother Moana, the Pacific Ocean, and how, um, I guess that's the biggest point I want to bring into this room, is that um, as people of the Pacific, we, we see the ocean as, our, our grandmother, and so we love her a lot. And what Epeli Haofa says is that there's this idea in the West, right? That like say we're Pacific Islands. So we're Pacific Islands in a place, in a far away sea. Like far away there, there's like, you know, there's a uh, Yap, right? There's Atawal, you know, something, there, there's Balao, far away there in the ocean, you know? But he says, no, actually our Pacific ancestors, they knew they, they knew the concept that actually it, we are a sea of islands. So it's actually our grandmother Moana, she, she is the mass. See, she is the mass, and we are the islands in it. So it's a sea of islands. And so that's why he says Oceania is a sea of islands. And when we, th this is a truth that our, our ancient people always held, that, that this, is, this is our home, you know, Moana knew it. Moana Nui Akiwa is our home, the big ocean. And then we have our different islands, and that's our voyaging ways. We get to know each other. And then in this big sea mass, we're able to come to North America and meet Native people here. We're able to go to South America and meet Native people there, where that, that has been um, proved in, in, a, in documents that that has happened, and also in creation stories, which is actually even more accurate. You know, so. Um, I think that's all I want to say about that's that's how I learned about the ocean and the land. Thank you. Aloha kako. Aloha. O kiana la ie kawai Frank koli noa no kailua makamoku o kolau poko makamoku puni o o ahu o kono hua nui ko umauna. O apua kea ko ua, o piko a kea ko upuna vai, o kahana iki, o kahavai, o kawai nui ko uloko, o kailua ko umoana. Aloha, I bring these names of the aina, the land, and the vai, and the ocean that shaped me from my hometown of Kailua, Oahu, where being engaged in these spaces defined who I am. When I was a little girl, my great-grandmother told me the mo'olelo, or the story of the lepo aia, the edible mud of Kauai Nui. She told me that it was so ono, so delicious, <laughs> like the sweetest, freshest poi you could ever imagine. Kailua was known for this edible mud. We were called the dirt lickers by those of Hilo. 
But Kamehameha sailed from Kohala, and he brought his warriors into Kauai Nui, Kailua Bay, and he fed of his warriors this lepo aia, my most favorite flavor, the poi. She told me the only way you could harvest it was to be absolutely silent. If you uttered even a single word, the mud would hide from you forever. <laughs> when I got older, the story changed. <laughs> if you utter even a single word, the mud would cover you up, suck you down, and you'd never hear from you ever again. <laughs> so color me intrigued. Uh, I was stoked on this mo'olelo. So if you can imagine a little six-year-old me with my bucket and shovel, absolutely quiet, tasting a shit ton of mud. The red mud, the green mud, the gray mud, all the muds that were not delicious. But it was in this process of engaging with my environment that I started to develop my kilo, my observation, and my connection to place. And it was in this process of kilo that I started asking questions. I started wondering, why did the green mud kind of taste like limu or seaweed? Why did the red mud taste like, um, you know like when you bite the inside of your mouth? Yeah, that. And why did the black mud, you guys ever smelled black mud? Yeah, yeah. Not so delicious. <laughs> Where was this edible mud, this lepo ai that my grandmother spoke of that was famous in Kailua from Kauai Nui? But at that age, I knew Kauai Nui as a marsh, clogged, invasive, full of vegetation. It wasn't until I got older that I learned that Kauai Nui was a fish pond, a lokoi'a one of the biggest food baskets in Kailua with the capacity to produce over 500,000 of pounds of fish per year. Wow. How did we transform from this basket of abundance that was managed so well from Mauka the mountain to Makai the sea that we could literally eat the mud from the bottom of the pond? into this clogged, invasive, pathogen-ridden space that I grew up next to. It was this line of inquiry that really shaped my career trajectory. I chose a career in research because Hawaii's future requires skilled local and indigenous individuals who can bring contemporary science and technology to bear on our contemporary challenges of coastal resource management, water sustainability, food security, that all reflect the values of our local Hawaiian people. So many years later, I still am in the mud. And I study the unseen world that manages all of the changes in the environment that supports the productivity. I study our ancestral elements, our ancestors, our akua. I study these microbes that transform place for production and sustainability. And I use contemporary tools like microbiology to help to decode all of that knowledge that was left to us from our ancestors. They keloed their environment. They observed from mountain to sea and beyond. And they encoded all that phenomenological observations of climatic patterns, uh, food web dynamics, geological phenomena in Mo'olelo, Mele, and Oli. Our stories, our chants, and our songs so that they can be preserved for generations. But somewhere along that line, you know, colonization, all the things, we've forgotten how to understand all the layers in our stories. 
And so I tried to use contemporary science as a mechanism to decode thousands of years of research and unlock that so that we can better apply it to management today. I use contemporary techniques to kilo the environment in the context of today. Our kupuna didn't have roadways or cesspools or you know, Netflix. <laughs> it's a little bit different today. And so how can we inform the best policy and decision making about our resources today that stand on the shoulders of our ancestral knowledges and apply what our kupuna knew to today? So one of the threads that I heard, I'm sure you've all heard loud and clear from all, hearing from all three of our panelists, is relationships and connections across generations, across time and space. And um, I want to talk about, you know, in the quote unquote colonized, mainstream, capitalistic society, um, a lot of those connections are really not encouraged. Um, but I, I want to talk about how we can encourage people to make connections to learn about the land and the ocean and how they're connected. And specifically, I'd want to ask you, Kiana, um, how do you get kids excited about mud like, <laughs> like you were? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I want to start off with connections and relationships. So the Hawaiian word for relationship is pilina. And our kupuna, our ancestors, were able to create such abundance because they understood the relationship between the atmosphere and the climatic and temporal world, the papahuli lani, with the geological oceanography, the, the earth, papahuli honua, and how those intersected to create all that is born, papahanao moku, right? And they understood intrinsically those relationships because they observed them for generations and assimilated all that knowledge. And so as we engage with place today, those relationships and that pilina is important. That pilina to our, our aina. Aina is our kumu. It is our source. It is our teacher to the vai of this place. It is also our pilina to our akua. Uh, it could be interpreted as gods, but also elements, the elements of, of our place and those unseen elements that are shaping all the things around us. And the pilina to the people that live there and steward this place every day. And so in my journey of science and, and research and academia, right, my first step is to understand pilina to place. What are the stories of this place? Where does the water come from? How does it flow? What did it look like traditionally? And what do those stories tell us? Because there's so many layers within it. And to get students excited into these processes, right? you have to connect science or STEM to their epistemological worldview. You have to bring it into a space that they understand. So for example, I work in a lot of fish ponds. Now, fish ponds are a 14th century innovation of the Hawaiian people to basically produce a lot of fish. I grew up next to Kauai Nui. My ohana built fish ponds on Molokai. They exist at the interface of land and sea, and they promote abundance not only within the fish pond, but throughout. They seed uh, nearshore fisheries and, and maintain health across the entire Aupua'a from the mountain to the sea. Now, there's a special fish pond, He'ei fish pond, called Pihi Lokoi'a. It's an 800-year-old fish pond that stands a testament to the ingenuity of the Hawaiian people. And one of the mo'olelo that they share is the story of Meheanu. Meheanu is like the female dragon guardian of the space, the kia'i mo'owahine. Now, many fish ponds have dragon guardians that are, they're dragons, they're fierce. They predate Pele. They are the originators. You don't want to go and do battle with a dragon. Right? And they're women because these spaces are influenced by the tide. They're cyclical. Um, and they're very maternal. You don't want to go against a mama when she's protecting her babies. Right? These are nurseries. And so the story of Meheanu is that 
her job is to protect the fish of this fish pond. And she comes down to ensure that the kia'i, or the stewards of this place, are actually doing their job to protect the fish and sharing and building all that pilina with the fish pond, with their community. And if she's not happy, she has the capacity to hide the fish, right? So on one level of this mo'olelo, it's all about how you behave in an environment like this. You are respectful. You share with your community. And you're always looking, for, looking out for the baby fish. Because if you don't do that, you don't eat. Now, the next layer of the story is you know that she's present because the hoe turns yellow. And the hoe turns yellow because, you know, when, when Tutu Meheanu comes to visit, sometimes she needs to relieve herself in the back of the pond. Right? Yellow, ammonia. When I heard this story, I got plugged into the color yellow and pee and urine and what does that mean for, for the geochemical cycles in this pond. And that mo'olelo shaped a hypothesis about, huh, maybe this is talking about the cycling of nitrogen in the pond. And so we did an experiment where for an entire year we went out and we sampled the pond for its geochemical composition as well as microbial. And we found that every time the kia'i of this space said, Meheanu is in this pond, we have to be you know, on our best behavior, grandma is visiting, right? we would see these spikes in ammonia. So our, our observations of space today is so strong with a story that existed from 800 years ago. And so this story from its secondary layer tells us about the biogeochemical cycling in the pond and the management, right? Our kia'i could have planted how all along an 88-acre pond, which is very big. You can fit all of Ala Moana in this pond. <laughs> and they could spock out all the yellow, whoop, and then go and, and mediate the cycling of water there. Now, Meheanu's job is to make sure that the baby fish are well taken care of. They're well fed. What does grandma do when she comes to visit? She brings treats, right? So when we look at this story from a microbiological perspective and use, use contemporary microbiology to analyze this system, right, we start to put names to all the microbial players. And we see that when there's these spikes of ammonia, when Tutu Mehanu comes to visit, we see these blooms in Sinecococcus, which are one of the favorite food of the little tiny mullet, the ama ama, which we're trying to grow. So from this layer, we see that this mo'olelo is also about how the biogeochemistry and management and cycling relates to the food web topology. Right? So these very big biological science-y concepts are all about relationship. And we get kids connected to these spaces because they makahana ka'ike. They learn by doing. They get dirty and wet. And they feel the presence of meheanu in this space. And they're learning about science in the context of a story that matters to them. And then to ulu kale'ala, to bring joy to the process, we do what our kupuna did. We hula. We dance about it. Because that really cements that knowledge and makes it fun. And then we share it on social media. You know? <laughs> That's how we really hit this generation. Right? But at, at the crux of this, it's about students not only building a relationship to the place that they come from, the stories, their kupuna, their ancestors, their akua, but also a relationship to the subject matters that are decoded in the stories that they grew up with and hopefully inspire them in the way that the lepo'ai inspired me. <laughs> Well, um, we all wouldn't be here today, like literally be here on Karina's land, <laughs> uh, 
if it weren't for that word that's been thrown about casually a few times here and there, settler colonial capitalism. And um, there's been a lot of displacement. I mentioned earlier, Loa, she, you're local here. I live in California now. And, um, but you do a lot of this great work and you carry a lot of this knowledge. And I know you've gone back and forth, uh, but we, it's our home here now in California. So um, I, I know you work with a lot of community members and youth as well. And I wanted to ask you, um, how, what are some ways for people who are disconnected ourselves? Maybe we're not in our homeland. Maybe we live in a city like Berkeley. How can we connect to um, the oceans and the connections between land and ocean? Yeah, thanks, Alexis. That's a really great question. And thank you so much, Kiana, for, for that beautiful story. And I just want to continue with that conversation. And I think it's just, it always goes back to just what we're talking about, our relationship to land and water. You know, I was, I was beginning, and I, I, I guess I got a little overwhelmed, but I was beginning to talk about um, voyaging. I'm not a voyager. I actually don't even know how to swim. And yeah, and, and yeah, it is really funny, especially because I come from an island, but that's actually a direct result of, um, my, of my colonial present. When the missionaries came to um, Tonga, they didn't want the girls to go out. Um, they didn't want the girls to go out and um, be wet because it, it was very suggestive for, for them. And so it was something that was banned, especially when you live in the town. And so I always, um, you know, when you live in, a, in what we call a city, of course, it's not like these big cities. But um, I, I always uh, liked the kids who live further from the towns because, you know, those kids just jump into that water, you know, tulihopo, right, into that wharf and just swim like nothing, you know. But that's, um, so this is how colonization happened to us as Tongans in so many different ways. But I guess what I want to talk about, uh, you know, we have like exactly what you're talking about. Um, exactly what you're talking about, though, about all these, the concepts you're talking about, the ones, the Hawaiian ones, you know, and these, and um, the new science um, concepts that you're talking about. It's, um, it's just the same thing that I forgot to talk about. Um, the concept that we always held in Moana Nui Akiwa, in the Pacific, we always, ha you know, we have some concepts that are really important to us. And one of our concepts that is across the Pacific is, in, in Tongan, we call it Dauhi Va. And that's the relationship, and that's exactly what you're talking about in, in your story. Really, when it comes down to it, so what, how, how were we able to voyage for so many, for, for, for such a long time that Europeans didn't even, you know, the um, Pacific was so uncharted even in the 1800s. And yet it was an uncharted center for us. We were voyaging, we were um, getting to know each other, we were intermarrying, we were trading, we were learning so many ways to voyage too. I know that the Micronesian canoes, for instance, that changed the Tongan Tongyaki, and that changed everyone's because you could, you could flip the, um, the sails back and forth with, with their canoes, and we learn from each other that way. And so, but what the um, foundation of that is with Dauhiva is ca really caring for your relationship with each other. From the relationship you have like with, with Tongans, with our families, our villages, and then even your relationship with those who are closer next to us, like the Samoans and the Fijians, and those outer, you know, out uh, more from us, like having to voyage to Hawaii, for instance, would have been um, a massive thing to do, of course, like the, the Tahitians did. Or having to voyage, I went to the Solomon Islands in 2012, and I met that there's, um, you know, these, these um, Western ideas of Polynesian, Micronesian, and Melanesian, as, as you know, you may know about real life, that doesn't stand. You know, so I went to a place that's Melanesian, and um, there were so many Polynesians there, that these people who came, out, who came directly from where I lived, who voyaged there. And so that concept of Dahiba, it's, it's really to tell that creating relationships are so important. It was so important for a voyaging people to have voyaging for several generations. Because that's, you know, that's a, like, every, like everything in life, really, it's a, a, a live or die situation, you know, when you're out there in the ocean with your whole family. And so, um, and it's still very important today. I just want to say also about teaching kids. I, I teach at Tennyson High School, which is in South Hayward. 
a lot of our students are recent immigrants, even refugees. We have refugees from the countries that are at war right now. And a lot of our, our, our students are also indigenous from places in what we know as South America today. You know, and uh, one of the biggest things that we do in our class that the kids know, and they're just waiting for it when they come down from the classroom to the, to the farm. We call it a farm because it's not a, a it's, it's a two acre. So that's bigger than a school garden, you know? And that's a real blessing. And one, one thing that, I see my time's up, but one of the things that the students always do, they come down, because they're coming down from kind of like up there to the farm down here. And they, they are, they're giggling and they love it. And then they sit in the circle and they, I'm always like, so, okay, everybody, you know? We, we do, we, we thank the Ohlone and we say, and what's, what's the next thing we do? And the kids always go, touch the ground. So, you know, yeah, it's time to now touch the ground. You know, it's a really profound act for them and, and to do it every day. I think we need that kind of repetition in our lives and to teach the kids a repetition. I mean, our churches, you know, taught us how to be really repetitious in, in praying and stuff like that. So to undo that, we also have to be re really repetitious about how to smell a flower. And I'm not saying that in a, like, just like a petty way, but to really understand, you know, our, our, um, our funua, and it's also, and also our moana, the water and the land. Malo. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. You know, just reflecting on what I've been listening to um, in the short time we've been, so we could go all day and all night, but we can't because we're in a colonial construct. But uh, anyway. Um, one, of, one of the things that struck me in just a short time we've been sitting here is this panel is called Indigenous Science. And I've heard more Indigenous Science in this short time here than I was probably ever taught in the public schools, oh, K through 12. So I want to thank all of you for that. And the other thing that's really exciting about all of you here is, um, you know, in the formal sciences, talking about blending the formal, what they call Western science, with the indigenous science that you're all doing so well. And oftentimes we're taught um, falsely that the Western science is the only science because it's so-called objective. It's not. The things that shape the questions of Western science come from a subjective mind mindset and a point. So I'm really excited about the work you're all doing. So I want to um, pose a question to you and ask you, um, I want to learn a little bit more about, about your work and your research in the ocean and how you kind of bring those two things together. And yeah, I want to hear more about it. So um, I guess like when I think about my science and my culture and how I, I brought those together, when I was a, a master's student, I went to Hawaii Pacific University. I was fortunate to go on a couple of research cruises to Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Um, Papahanaumokuakea is one of the largest marine reserves in the world. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful ecosystem. Um, I get like caught up when I think about it because mm -hmm. this, this is what our oceans really should look like. Um, it's beautiful, it's vibrant, it's healthy. And it's, it's, a, it's composed of islands and atolls of coral reefs. And um, it's very, Papahanaumokuakea is very important culturally to Hawaiians. Um, there's many, many cultural sites there. It's important from a cosmological perspective. And it's, it's here that really that the connection between my science and my culture really strengthened. Um, and it's where I became interested in studying the impacts of global climate change stressors to coral reefs. So um, ocean warming, which causes coral reef bleaching, um, and ocean acidification, which is, is a challenging concept to explain to people sometimes, but I think of it as the osteoporosis of the sea, right? It breaks mm -hmm. down the bones and the structures of the reef that provides the home for everything. Um, and so uh, in the Kumulipo, which is the Hawaiian creation chant, right? It's basically like our genealogy. Um, the koa, the coral, is the first organism to come out of the ocean. 
And so Hawaiians knew from very, very long ago that the ko'a, the pu ko'a, the coral reef, was the foundation to all life on, in the ocean and that we had to protect the pu ko'a for, the, for ocean organisms to survive. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that's kind of where I, I got interested in, in, in studying coral reefs, this, I, this connection to my culture, the importance of coral reefs to my culture, um, the importance of coral reefs to my family and the practices that we do around fishing and the importance of coral reefs in, in feeding my family. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a really big deal. Um, I just returned to Kauai recently and I hadn't been there for nine years. And I um, snorkeled some of the same reefs I snorkeled nine years ago, and it was a different site. And even uh, snorkeling in places in Oahu, there, where I snorkeled as a kid, it's a different site. And we are seeing these changes over time. And um, those ones are easy to see, but a lot of people um, can't conceive of the ocean as an ecosystem. They see it at surface level. And like I said, can't connect it to living here on land if you're not with it living in it every day and there are a lot of a lot of issues going on um, like you said oceanic warming um, ocean acidification the garbage patch um, methane coming up from the warming up in the more northern waters the list goes on and on and on and it's it's really depressing and it's easy to uh, have what they call crisis fatigue. Like, like if you watch the news all day, you get numb to it and tune it out. But this is a real, this is a real issue. We have um, deep sea mining now. We have an issue of um, people trying to fix climate change by fertilizing the ocean by dumping tons and tons of nitrogen into it. And it's, people think it's okay because they don't think about the bottom of the sea and where's that nitrogen if it doesn't fix into algae? The only, th there was a, a tribe that was sort of duped, I guess, it's not a nice way of saying it. Uh, they were convinced that it would be a good idea to do this test and it ended up with a huge algal bloom. And it was, uh, a lot of indigenous people are being used as pawns in the climate change game, as figureheads and um, without looking to our solutions that are rooted and our traditional values, whether those solutions be Western science and technology based, indigenous science and technology based, or a little bit of a mix of the both. So um, I would like to um, ask each of you to just um, share with us a set of remarks, maybe something a little hopeful, <laughs> now that I brought you all down, um, <laughs> now that I've debbied down the whole thing. Um, yeah, what are, among these issues, um, broad, a specific issue or a general around taking care of our ocean that we love, um, what can some people begin to think about or do or learn uh, to address this? So we'll start with you. Okay. <laughs> um, so many of our future, many of the answers for our future to all these contemporary challenges exists in the past. Ikava ma muakava ma hope. Ancestral Hawaiian management practices are the models that we need to emulate as contemporary innovation, right? We need to think about innovation as restoration and restoring indigenous systems of practice unlocks thousands of years of research, research and development from peoples who really showed that regenerative thinking is possible, right? And, and as a Pacific Islander, you know, we are disproportionately affected by climate change, sea level rise, ocean acidification. Our kupuna created abundance because of very conscientious management practices from the mountain to the sea that supported a flourishing ocean. 
Um, as my friends would say, no snail, no whale, right? <laughs> we have our kahuli in the mountain that are grazing on all the leaves of our ohia that allow the ohia to grow and flourish. And they have intricate uh, rooting patterns and lichens that slow down the rain and allow that water to penetrate into our aquifers rather than wash off into the ocean. And when we get into those deep waters of our aquifers, that is the realm of Kanaloa. Kanaloa is the element of healing and, and depth. He's also the element of the ocean and marine life. And so Kanaloa exists on land. And the practices that we do on land to perpetuate his health and his ability to heal. And as that we prevent that water from running down and washing sediment into our reefs, right? We're promoting these environments along the coast that support whales. Our kupuna named the humpback whale kohola. Koho is um, to follow la, the sun. So the kohola migrate following the sun, right? They start in Alaska. Um, in the summertime, taking advantage of all that upwelling, which, you know, microbes, primary productivity, lots of yummy foods for whales. They get really big and fat. And then they carry all of that energy from Alaska to Hawaii. And along that journey, they give birth to baby whales and they join us in Hawaii. There's um, an Ili Aina, there's an Ahupua'a on the Hamako coast on the big island, Kohola Lele, where the, where the humpback whales come and they jump and they enjoy and they flourish and they do what marine animals do, right? They pee and they poop. And, and all of those microbial additions into the water from the nutrients brought from Alaska helps to seed and, and create our flourishing coral reefs. And so all of these layers of holistic management from one island, one archipelago chain across the Pacific are really mechanisms that connect all of Oceania. And so moving back towards these indigenous models, right? They are proven models for sustainable solutions into the future. Malo, Kiana. Yeah. You know, Alexis, when I when you when you talk about all of these things that are happening in the ocean, and particularly like for me, um, the deep sea mining is something that's coming up, and that um, in Oceania we're fighting um, very hard for right now. But again, I that's why um, that's one of the tenants is to for. Um, one of the tenets to mitigate or, or to, uh, to, well, one of the tenets for climate justice, of course, is to follow indigenous leadership. And so, like, yeah, how do we break that down, right? Um, like, we're in the indigenous forum, what does that mean? And so I'm just going to go back to what I said in the beginning of this panel, is that, so when I hear about all these things that are happening to the ocean, even with um, deep sea mining, which breaks my heart deeply, um, I stand firm in, the, in my grandmother ocean, Mwananui Okiwa. There's a power in that, that that is where I'm from. And that all those teachings are the teachings of my ancestors. My ancestors went through this. I'm going through it. And the kids are going to come up in the future, you know, so like I see indigenous kids in this room. They also hold that. But that's why the concepts that our ancestors teach us are so important, like that concept that we are an ocean, that you know, we, are, we are the great Pacific Ocean. It's not as a way of um, to be arrogant and to dominate. It's, it's to remember, to remember those, those teachings of the ancestors and to hold deep into them. Um, 
part of that, uh, you know, and that's when I brought up Dauhiva. Dauhiva is so important. It's our relationships. So like with all these things happening, it's so important our relationships to each other still. You know, like whatever you're talking about, you could bring anything up. It's our relationships to each other, you know. I've been working, like you said in my bio, there was a couple farms that I worked in. We had some really tough times, you know. We had tough times um, with white and um, indigenous and, 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 and farmers of color. We, have, we had so many tough times with um, men um, sexually harassing women. We had many tough times with, with what was going on. But for me, when I remember that I am a, a, a Tama, a child of the Moana, I, I know that, that we could move forward or we could, we could stand together at this time and work things out. And they're so hard. They're really difficult to work out. But um, I also wanted to add, as, as just knowing that the relationships are so important. So, you know, like I'm, um, I was an immigrant to this country and um, leaving Tonga is one of the biggest heartache in my life and losing the language when I left my country. And, um, and I came to Utah, we came through the Mormon church. But coming here to California and then learning about like Karina Gould's work here, that's, you know, being a child of the Pacific, understanding Tauhiba is like the central part of my life. I got it. When I heard the call for Sigourite, we said, we hear it. It's like the call of the whale, you know, that we heard this morning. We, we hear it and we're gonna join it, and we went. So, you know, we hear, we hear the different calls, you know, these, these calls, I, I, Karina in the, last, um, in the last panel said, say yes. When you hear the calls, say yes to them. They're calls to, for you to live. And yeah, we have all these things happening and we gotta fight. That's the way we gotta live too, because it's also fun, right? I mean, you know, one of my funnest times is, is fighting against <laughs> the systems, you know, together with people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I just wanted to add, because this is the Indigenous Forum, as an Indigenous person, you know, also those times were so fun because we were drinking and drugging and having a lot of sex. And, um, but uh, as, as a, you know, as an Indigenous person, I want to say that I'm in recovery. You know, that's really important to me. And that to me is, yeah, that's a fight. That, that's a fight for my life, recovery each day. So, you know, that's, these, these are, th this is how we stay true to our ancestors. We walk that path and that's how we in Moana Nui Akiwa, we remember that we are the Pacific. We're the stewards. We may not have the, we may not voyage right now, but we voyage in these different ways. And they're just as, they're, they're life or death, right? And so, yeah, mahalo. Yes, life or death. Um, you know, I think one of the many reasons that Indigenous people and Indigenous scientists are so powerful is that we have a very powerful why. Why are you doing this work? Because my family, my culture, and my community depends on it for survival. So when we face challenges and roadblocks, we have this endless source of strength to draw from, which is this boundless love of our culture, right? So I guess my takeaway is, you know, find your why, do whatever you gotta do to stay connected to that why, because that why will be the driver for all of the work that you do, and it's gonna be the endless source of strength that you draw from. And then when you finally do get a table, a, the seat at the table of the people who make decisions about our future, and hopefully all of you will get a seat at that table because we need more indigenous people at that table, you know, remember that there's all of this wealth of knowledge embedded in our community, this traditional knowledge and genealogical knowledge. Go out and talk to your kupuna and your elders, sit in your environment, listen, kilo, watch, feel, taste all the mud that you can yeah. taste, you know, and um, bring all of that knowledge together to develop the solutions and the policies that we need to and address all of our environmental challenges.
Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, each of you. I really appreciated everything you had to say. And I really like that you ended on a systemic structural. All of you talked about structural changes because we're constantly being told that there are individual actions that we can take and should take to protect the environment, to protect the ocean. And that's true. Um, we should not be putting chemicals in our laundry machines. If we can afford it and we're lucky enough to, we should not be eating fruits and vegetables uh, from companies that leach chemicals into the ocean, um, which is rampant in Hawaii and on the coast of California and all over, uh, all the coastlines. There are individual things we can do, but just being here and listening and learning today, I would encourage each of you to keep learning, keep staying on that journey, and um, really try to address this, this at the policy level. If you're an organizer, that's great. If you can give money, that's great. If you can volunteer a talent of yours, that's great too. Um, so, and, and then I just kind of want to make a side note an impromptu side note. Um, we've been hearing some talk about the uh, Hokuelea, and for those of you who don't know what it is, um, it's the Hokuelea too, actually. Um, it is the boat um, that Native Hawaiians made in the 70s, and you can correct me, 1974 or something, and they went to Micronesia to relearn the um, traditional star navigation and it wasn't lost, and it's something that can be revived, and it's here with us today. And now there are, I don't know, dozens, hundreds of people in the Polynesian Voyaging Society. They're based out of Oahu, and they are going to be doing a launch in June, um, in June of this year uh, from Juneau, Alaska, because um, they don't have those big trees on the islands anymore. So they actually got the first tree from, um, Alaska Natives in Southeast, and they got another one. And so we have a relationship between Alaska and Hawaii. So um, they are going to, it's a two and a half year journey. It is the first journey captain by a female captain, <laughs> traditional, so yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. Um, I tried to get them here, but they're really busy. <laughs> so if you want to see them, um, Come find me later and I'll give you more information. They're gonna, it's a two and a half year journey and every single port of call, they're going to be talking about oceans and climate change and indigenous science for this. So uh, give yourselves a big round of applause. Thank you for joining us. And uh, if you would like to uh, take a picture, you're welcome to take any pictures you want now. And we will stand up uh, for some group photos and a question, Kara, can we do a question? Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay, who asked that? Three minutes. Okay, Roger. Would you say that you are... Would you, would you say that um, indigenous people of Turtle Island are stewards of the land? And Hawaii, you know, the people of Hawaii is um, stewards of the ocean. The people of the islands are the stewards of the oceans. And if we could link arms and hands to fight off these incredible atrocities to all of it, to fight as a one unit, as stewards of the planet. Yeah. I mean, it just come to me sitting here listening. So I just wanted to put that there as to what I'm thinking as the power of unity and kind of love. Oh, oh. oh. Floor is open. Yeah, I would. Well, yeah, um, yeah um, the people from Oceania are definitely not stewards of, of Turtle Island. That's, um, you, that's the native people of Turtle Islands. That's, that, you can't give us your land, land back already. Yeah, you know, you're gonna take care. Your, your daughter was just up here talking about it, you know, and, and she's, gonna, she's doing a great job and she's following a lot of things too that you're passing down. So no, you're still, sorry, you're still the stewards of your place. So um, you, you better just do a good job. But um, yes, uh, but no, a lot of people try to contest us with our, with our ocean and our lands. And they want to be stewards of our places. No, no, you can't. This is this is our 
like the sisters in, in um, Hawaiian kuleana. This is our kuleana. You can't take that away from us. And we're going to fight for you. We're going to fight. So, but yes, let's join together. Yes. I would like to say something that I wanted to say earlier, because we've got a lot of youth in the audience here and here at Bioneers. And um, shameless plug, I have a children's book. Uh, I, will be, it will, I will be tabling it out here. It's on pre-order, a second children's book. Um, but uh, I wanted to make the main character something that kids, most people don't know that most indigenous, most native people um, on this continent live in cities instead of rural reservations and rural places. And um, I, of course, grew up around a lot of Pacific Islanders, um, you know, on this coast too. And um, so I did make the, the main character is modeled after one of my friend's granddaughters, but uh, she's fictional, but she's Chamorro because I wanted, because <laughs> I wanted our, our Pacific Islander urban indigenous youth to finally for once see themselves in a book and be seen and be recognized for the talents they have because they're the ones who are going to grow up to be like you and do this work. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.